Thank you guys for being here and for sort of, uh, giving up the uh, happy hour on the beach, which I feel like is a really tough draw. I'm not, I'm sort of surprised there's anyone up here. Um, I think you got my background already. I did spend a long time at Fortify Software working on static analysis, but that has nothing to do with what I do now. Um, the interesting thing for me, honestly, in my current role at NetSuite is being at a, uh, uh, a consumer of security technology, right? I've spent my entire career building security products, and to some extent I do for NetSuite now, but also I'm much closer to and much more aware of the challenges a particular company, a single company, has in securing itself than I was working at a vendor previously. And one of the biggest challenges that companies trying to protect themselves faces, face today is the talent shortage. Finding enough people with security skills, either for dedicated roles or to fill roles like development or testing or operations that have security aspects to them. Finding enough of the right people with the right skills to fill those positions and then retaining them because it's such a competitive market that once you find the right people, often they're moving on to the next position very quickly. And so what I want to talk about today is a little bit of where I think the, the state of security and software security in particular is today, some of the factors that compound the talent shortage and the talent problem that we face, and then I'll spend most of the talk talking about seven different areas that I think, seven different actions we can all take to help address the talent gap. And those will range from very strategic activities like really retrofitting what it means to get a computer science degree and how we think about instructing the next generation of computer scientists, all the way down to very, very tactical activities like running a dedicated security internship program or highlighting security in uh, marketing and uh, contracts with partners and other external communication. So first off, where are we today? Um, you know, Mark Andreessen said it well, I think, when he said software is eating the world. We have software doing more things for us in more places, being written by more people, and therefore carrying more importance in our lives and in our society and in our economy than ever before. And at the same time, or really as a result of, we see more and more breaches targeting that software layer, right? The vast majority of breaches, I'm preaching to the choir here at OWASP, obviously, the vast majority of breaches target those applications and we're just writing more and more of that bad software every year that goes by. There's some challenges, I think, or factors that really complicate this for, for companies today, for organizations today. Um, the first is the way we uh, deploy, deliver, and consume software services. Increasingly, software is deployed in a public data center uh, or uh, a cloud environment that is very, um, much less under our control than it was 10 or 20 years ago. Maybe it's not under our control at all. Maybe we have some visibility into it, but probably very little. And we're interacting with users on a much more diverse set of devices. They're connecting over laptops and mobile devices, probably ones that uh, our company doesn't own or doesn't have software on. And then they're communicating between that device and that backend over a network that we probably have little insight or control over, you know, Wi-Fi at the local Starbucks. So this, this change in the way we consume IT is expanding the attack surface for software and making it harder for the good guys to interfere with attacks in the way that they used to. The next is uh, market economics. And we've seen adversaries get better and better at organizing around an underground marketplace and monetizing the intelligence that they generate and the skills that they have. And as with any market, that has led different adversaries to specialize in different aspects of breaches. And as we see, again, in any market, specialization leads to increased capability. So we see the bar on effectiveness of attackers rising slowly over time. And we see increasingly an ability to compose different aspects of a breach from different actors to mount one large campaign. That's hard to, to, to fight against, again, because of that increased capability. And then finally, we have regulation and compliance. And, and these external constraints placed on us sometimes are very powerful, right? They've done a lot to increase awareness around security. And they've helped companies that might not know where to start define what a good lower bar for security in their organization looks like. The challenge is, I think, twofold. One. Compliance and regulation trains us to strive, particularly at the executive level, trains us to strive for that lower bar. They say, this is how good you need to be, and few people ever ask, well, do I need to actually be better in order to be secure? 
And second, it normalizes the industry. So more and more companies look the same in terms of the lower bar that they're meeting. And I think that makes it, on average, easier for adversaries to uh, attack us as an industry because we look more and more like one another. So what does the combination of all this uh, generation and adoption of software, along with these challenges that make securing those software systems harder, wh where does that leave us? Well, I think it leaves us in a really unbalanced battle where the adversary only has to be right once, right? They can try to compromise us 1,000 or 10,000 or 100,000 times, and if they get through one time, then they win. And conversely, we have to be right every single time. If we fail even once, then we've lost. So while we're in this unbalanced struggle, we're missing almost half of our, our troops, if we want to use the battle analogy. Um, Hanuman and HP Security did research in 2014 that showed that roughly 40% of security positions in the U.S. were vacant throughout the year. Not filled by the wrong person or someone with insufficient skills, but completely vacant. And when they looked at senior management and senior individual contributor roles, so the folks that are having the most influence on a given program, the vacancy rate was even higher. It was 49%, almost 50. So we're in this unbalanced battle, we have to be right every time, and we're missing half, almost half of the people that are supposed to, to help us win. Well, maybe that's okay. Security is a very tiny portion of any given IT organization or software organization. In fact, most of the security-relevant decisions that are made on a daily basis are made by people who don't have security in their job title. They're developers or testers or operations folks. We wanted to look at how well trained these people were, how well equipped they were to fill in for the missing security people, right? To make the right decision at the right time when they were faced with it. And so we looked at the top 10 computer science schools, uh, according to US News and World Report in 2014, and picked apart their different course curricula, um, not Caltech because they don't publish theirs, but we looked at nine of the top 10. And we categorized the courses by whether they were uh, focused on security or whether they included security as a topic, and whether they were required courses or elective courses. And what we found is across the nine of the top 10 that we looked at, there were zero required courses focused on security. So that means in 2014 or early 2015, you could graduate from any of the top universities in the United States and have never heard more than a few lectures that even mentioned security at any point in your college career. I would argue even worse, only three of the top 10 even had topical coverage of anything that resembled software security. So we have to assume that whole generations of developers are coming out of top programs today not well equipped to solve security problems when they're faced with them, and certainly not well equipped to go fill one of these vacant security roles without significant additional training and education. The problem actually starts earlier than college and university, though. Um, Raytheon did research in 2015 looking at uh, young adults, high school and early college age people in 12 countries around the world, including the US. And what they found was pretty concerning, I would say. Um, a vast majority in every region except the Middle East, 62% globally, 64% in the US, had never had any exposure to cybersecurity as a career opportunity, right? No teacher, no guidance counselor, no one had ever mentioned, you're interested in technology, maybe you want to go into cybersecurity. And so if there was a, a burgeoning interest, right, some fledgling in interest in the field, there was nothing done to encourage it. There was no kind of shove in the right direction. Even without that encouragement, I'm sorry, I'm getting a slide ahead. Let me uh, cover one more thing here. And because of that, only 31% of the folks they surveyed were seemingly well-equipped to enter a field, in cyber, enter a role in cybersecurity upon leaving the, the school, primary or secondary, that they were in. What I was starting to say before is, even with that lack of encouragement, even without that push towards cybersecurity, we still see that 38% of youth surveyed in these 12 countries wanted access to more training, wanted more inf information about cybersecurity roles so they could determine if they would be well suited to them. So even without doing really anything to encourage people down this path, we still see more than a third looking for it on their own. So where do we stand now? Um, 
security fundamentally in the last 15 years has become everyone's problem, right? When I started off at Fortify, people uh, frequently would argue that security wasn't part of development, right? That's not the software folks' responsibility. That's something that we'll fix afterwards by testing or by countermeasures like firewalls and antivirus. Today, everybody accepts that security is part of development. And we can't find enough people to, to do the work. Um, just a couple more stats. In 2014, there were 50,000 jobs posted that required a CISSP certification. That's roughly 75% of all the CISSP credentials that exist in the world. So clearly, those people are not all unemployed and going to fill these other positions. Um, just last year as well, um, 209,000 open positions across the US in cybersecurity and approaching a million, according to Cisco, worldwide. Frost and Sullivan recently did research that shows that they think the shortfall in open, unfillable positions in the private sector is going to reach one and a half million by 2020. Um, the growth in this number, the 209,000 US positions that are open, uh, is three and a half times faster than the growth in other IT positions. So the need for security professionals is radically outstripping the need for every other kind of professional in our field. All of this is compounded by a huge diversity problem as well. Um, less than or approximately 10% of security professionals today are women, and that number is that percentage is down 1% from two years ago. So we're trending in the wrong direction. That compares with 28% across IT as a whole. So the numbers are a little skewed across the field, but in security, they're that much worse, and they're headed in the wrong direction. Um, numbers are similar for minorities as well. So I think one of the big opportunities is to reach out to underrepresented populations and try to bring more of them into the field, and we'll talk more about that. So next slide is the seven things I think we can all do to solve this problem. But before that, I just want to qualify. As I mentioned, these solutions range from very strategic and high level. They're going to take longer than our lifetimes, in some cases, to fully realize, like fundamentally changing what a computer science degree looks like. But some of them are very tactical. And across the board, I think they are likely to involve three major stakeholders. I don't think we can make much progress without including all three of these. We've got to interface with the academic world. Right? This is where um, we all learn, a lot of us learn computer science, and computer science and programming are a big piece of security today. Government has a vested interest in this. They need to hire a lot of security professionals, but they also influence curriculum and motivate how people talk about job opportunities in the country. And then finally, obviously, the industry has a vested interest in this because we need to hire these people, right? We can't continue to succeed as businesses without being able to meet our IT security needs. And without having the right staff in, in our companies, we're not going to be able to do that. So these are the seven. I won't summarize them now. I'm just going to dive right in. They start from the most strategic, which I've alluded to a couple of times now. And this is we really have to fix what a computer science degree means. Um, we have for a long time taught computer scientists the wrong way to write code. We've taught them databases and networking and operating systems in an insecure way, and then we've expected them to get out into the real world and learn the right way to code those things. Textbooks today are riddled with examples of, at the very least, non-robust code, and in many cases, blatantly insecure code. And of course, no one ever reuses a little snippet of code they found in a textbook somewhere and uses it as the basis for something new. It's unheard of. So we've got to fix the textbooks. We've got to fix the course materials that professors use to instruct. But we also have to help think about the professor's skill set, right? Most people teaching computer science today learned how to do things before all of the concepts around secure coding that we've developed in the last 10 to 20 years had even been thought of. And so it's not enough to fix the textbooks. We also have to re-educate and, in some cases, maybe encourage turnover amongst professors so that we get folks that really have these skills inherently. And then what I believe is the third leg of the academic stool. So we fix the materials in the textbooks. We re-educate some of the professors and get this incorporated into the subjects that they teach. The third leg of the stool is verification. We have to have some mechanism for when students write bad code as part of a university course to give them feedback on that. And that might be automated. It might be using things like static analysis in some cases. Um, but in many cases, it's a process question, right? It's about having grad students that have the right knowledge to be able to give feedback on secure coding for a submission in a class that might not be 
specifically about security. Just to call a little more attention to this gap, I think, at the academic level, I want to compare computer science and another technical field, medicine. Becoming a doctor takes, on average, 10 to 12 years. People spend typically four years in an undergraduate program, another two years of coursework at the beginning of medical school, and then four to six years of hands-on, hands -on, increasingly practical experience with people that are trained and expert in their field. At the end of this, most of those folks know the field pretty well, right? They've become specialists in a given area, and they've actually practiced with patients for a long time. We'll compare that to becoming a programmer, right? You might do a four-year degree, or maybe not. Um, there's certainly no requirement to do so. And we've looked at the kind of security education you're going to get as part of one of those four-year degrees, even at the top universities in the country. A and then you go into the workforce, right? And then you're s expected to know everything you need to know to become a productive programmer. I can't tell you how many companies have told me the first few years they spend with someone fresh out of undergrad is spent finishing their education, right? Teaching them the rest of what they need them to know to be a programmer at their company. And to some extent, that will always be the case, right? Some amount of specialization and, and honing people to your company is fine, but it shouldn't be the fundamentals of secure coding. And I think the industry really has to put pressure back on the university system to, to retrofit in some of the ways that I'm talking about here. One of the best ways to put that pressure is to do what uh, my friend Joe Jarzenbeck, who ran Software Assurance for DHS until recently, likes to say, uh, likes to call pushing the demand button. The industry and organizations in general need to do better at being specific about what security skills they need in their new hires. They need in their partnerships. They need in every aspect of their business. They need to promote with their customers, for example. So, Signifying that security is a priority for a company and doing so in your internal and external communication is a great way to bring more people into the field and to really highlight to key stakeholders how important security is. I mentioned running a dedicated security internship program. This is a great way to tap into some of those folks who haven't had enough exposure or access to security knowledge but have an inkling that they might be interested, right? Um, you can get them inexpensively, you can get them while they're still malleable, preferably as part of an undergraduate program, and you can not only help teach them more of what they need to become effective security professionals for the industry, which is gonna help solve the problem for all of us, you can also teach them more of what you need them to know for your specific company, and then you can do everything you can to bring them in as full-time hires when they graduate. And from that perspective, it can be thought of as uh, an inexpensive training program, right? You hire someone for less than you will once they're a full-time employee, and you give them, uh, you, you bootstrap them on the kinds of knowledge they need to, to help you with the problems you're solving. Another broader way to press the demand button in hiring is to make sure that every job description your company publishes mentions the security-relevant aspects of that role. Obviously, if you're hiring somebody for the AppSec team, there's going to be a lot of security in the job description. But what about your entry-level development job descriptions? Do they talk about security at all? Do they talk about uh, a preference for a background in secure coding or some experience in secure coding or familiarity in common mistakes? I think the reality is most companies today do not. And the universities are paying attention to this, right? They watch that signal or lack of signal coming from the industry and they say, we're going to keep putting our, our emphasis and our priorities elsewhere because we don't see that that's something that companies are demanding. And I think that's starting to change, but I also th think it's something that we can each have a big impact on almost immediately by emphasizing those skills in the job descriptions. External communication, uh, aside from hiring, is an important place to prioritize security as well. So in the way we talk to our customers in marketing and direct customer communication, we should highlight security because it will make it clear to them that security is a priority for us. And it will call more attention to the importance of the field. In contracts and in partner relationships, I think this can be much more concrete, right? In many cases, by using the appropriate security language in a contract, you can offset some of your own liability and responsibility for, let's say you're outsourcing a piece of software, verifying the security of that software, and then maintaining it moving forward. Making these contracts stronger will actually help reduce the need for internal security talent at your company because you've offloaded some of that responsibility to whomever you've signed the contract with. 
This applies to M&A activities as well. I think security is infrequently as significant a topic in M&A and technical due diligence as it should be. Um, but the more attention is placed on it there, the more, again, we prioritize the field and we communicate to the, the company that we're potentially doing business with that this is important and all the people we're talking to there should understand that. The next area I want to talk about is promoting security. And I, I use the word promote sort of in, in a double entendre sense. We need to emphasize to our staff that security is important, and we also need to help put more security into our staff. And so it's about training and it's about job opportunities and recognition. Um, on the training side, I'd like to use an example from my friend Brad Arkin at Adobe, who built a really wonderful gamified training system based on belts, like you would find in martial arts, right? Like a white belt, a yellow belt. Um, so the more security training you get at Adobe, the higher ranking belt you get. And that's wonderful because it's, it's gamified, and computer scientists, we love games, so that's fun, right? I've got a higher rank than my buddies, and it encourages people to go through uh, optional training. But the, the complement to that, and, and really I think the thing that makes it a winning project, is a, a project management system that based on the nature of the project being developed, kind of revenue it's going to produce, time frame, et cetera, demands certain belts be present on the team producing it. So if you're building something that's going to build, you know, I'm just going to pull some numbers out of the air, $10 million in revenue, and we're going to work on it for 18 months, then you need at least two brown belts and a green belt on your project, product team, project team. That not only means you've got the right staffing on the team, which is a good idea, the right skill set, it also means people with those belts are now more sought after and see more opportunities within the company, see more reward other than quitting and taking a job somewhere else that pays better in receiving the additional training and making the investment in their own skills. And so I think that complement of you know, highlighting the training but then rewarding it very quantifiably with clear opportunities in the company has done great things there. Another example I'll give is about tying um, security to compensation and to uh, variable compensation, bonuses in particular. Um, one of the top 10 banks in the world that we did business with early in the, the days of Fortify was really uh, drank the Kool-Aid on using static analysis within the development organization and wanted developers to do a lot of the work, but they weren't sure how they would sort of change the paradigm within development and help people understand that now security was a core responsibility for them. What they did is tied those developers' annual bonus to their participation in the secure coding initiative, right? which meant, okay, you need to run these scans and fix these kinds of vulnerabilities and then tell us how it all went in the end. And as long as people went along with that process, then they got paid extra at the end of the year. And if they didn't, they didn't. And the win wasn't that we incentivized people with 10% you know, variable pay at the end of the year, it was that the fact that the company associated pay with this new effort made something click in the developers' heads. Right? It wasn't that, oh, I'm going to lose my $10,000. It's This must really be important, or the company wouldn't have aligned these two things. Right? My annual bonus wouldn't depend on this if it weren't a top priority. And they and I believe that they got a lot more adoption, a lot more um, quick uh, acceptance of the new paradigm than they would have without this because it, it really put their money where their mouth was. I was just uh, having a chat before the talk here and I mentioned that I think this is the one that has paid off the most for me personally in my own career and this is partnering with academic institutions whether it's a particular professor or a whole university or maybe just hiring some grad students part-time. Not only is academia the source of some of the problem, right? We, we haven't retrofitted the curricula in the way that we need to. They're also a, a big part of the solution. And so the more we as industry can do to share knowledge about the way systems in the real world are built, the kinds of problems they're facing, um, the kinds of skills we need graduates to have more, uh, in more detail than we can communicate through a job description, then the, the better the universities are going to be able to meet those demands. Vendors like my former employer, HP, and IBM, and others uh, give a lot of tools away to universities. And this is a great, great thing, right? Part of being a security professional today is probably using some tools at some point. But I think much more valuable is that knowledge sharing and that willingness to partner with them. Um, some of the cases where this has paid off the most for me in the past have been 
problems in my organization that I couldn't necessarily allocate enough or the right resources to, but that were interesting problems. And so by partnering with an academic organization, I was able to share some real world details that they were missing about the problem and get real problem solving from them in return. And so I think the, the short term and obvious win here is knowledge sharing back to academia. The tactical win for you though is a bigger recruiting pipeline, right? Those people that you are working with in their student roles are more likely to want to come work for you and more likely to understand your problem space if you've been working with them before they graduated. I think it's really important not to just focus on the top universities here. You know, it's easy to think, okay, if I'm not in San Francisco or Boston or Chicago, you know, maybe I shouldn't bother because there isn't a big research university right around the corner from me. But it couldn't be further from the truth. I think some of the schools that are doing the best work around really educating developers around the skills they need to do this stuff well um, are the smaller schools, more technical schools, community colleges in some cases. And so um, certainly, if you have the opportunity to work with a top research university, do so and look for the right kinds of projects to take to them. But also look at integrating with the academic world at lower uh, levels in the, in the hierarchy as well, smaller schools, schools that are more focused on areas that you're interested in. And you know, treat this as a, a network of recruiting opportunities for different kinds of people with different skills. So I mentioned the diversity problem up front, and I think, again, that's a, it's a problem in and of itself, but it's also an opportunity. If we need to fill more roles and we see that there are groups of people that are poorly represented, how can we bring more of those people in? Um, some programs that I think are doing a good job at this, uh, there are others, but I'll highlight a few. Um, scholarship for Women Studying Information Security has been around for years. It's been giving one to two small grants for women in the last two years of an undergraduate program or the first two years of a graduate program studying information security. Um, HP has put in another quarter of a million dollars to that and is now allowing them to fund, I don't know how many students, but significantly more students every year. And the cool thing about this is there's no um, explicit demand that those people then go work for HP or go work for the government. But there is certainly that opportunity. And I think if more companies put small amounts of capital into scholarship programs and other things like this to really encourage um, preferably underrepresented groups to get into the field, it will not only be good PR for those companies, but it will also be good quantifiably in terms of bringing more candidates in to the field and to their companies in particular. The Cyber Combat Academy from the Wounded Warrior Project is another good example. Um, if you're probably familiar with the Wounded Warrior Project, the idea of helping uh, former service members who come back uh, integrate into, gain the skills to, to integrate into private sector jobs, Cyber Combat Academy is obviously focused on cybersecurity in particular. And uh, I haven't worked with individuals coming out of this program personally, but I've worked with several uh, former service members, current service members, and folks who came out of the intelligence field. And my personal opinion is this is a great place to look for people in security because uh, many of them have already been trained quite a bit on the adversarial mindset, on the, the way we think about breaking systems in, in security, and I think it's a great starting point. Um, not to mention that lots of people coming into the military today have very deep technical skills as well, and so they've got the right foundation to move into these roles. The last project I'll talk about is called Year Up, and it has a, uh, like the Wounded Warrior Project, it has an aspect that is focused on security, but the program itself is broader than that. Um, Year Up works with uh, urban and inner city youth to um, place them in, educate them for, and then place them in technical internships. And uh, some of those are focused on security today, and I think that's a great area of opportunity for expansion. I don't think they're doing enough of that now. But a few years ago, I completed, uh, participated in a um, workshop that was put on by George Washington University. It was hosted by uh, Professor Matt Bishop from UC Davis here in California. And we talked for three days about how to fix the way we teach computer scientists. <clears throat> and the most interesting and unexpected result of that was if we wait until they're computer, computer science students, we've waited too long. We really have to start this education at high school or earlier. And the biggest thing that the group agreed on we needed to focus on in high school is understanding the consequences when something goes wrong, 
right? Understanding that if this thing isn't built properly or isn't operated properly, then bad things can happen to society. And I think, again, Year Up is a great example of trying to catch people a little before they get to their freshman year of college, right? Last two years of high school, teach them some of what they need to know and then set them on the direction to learn more. These last two steps aren't really about getting more talent. They're about minimizing our need for talent. Um, because the reality is we're never going to have enough security professionals. And even if somehow as an industry we, we solve that problem and we mint enough new security people, sorry, if we mint enough new security people, um, they'll still be expensive because it's still going to be a specialized role. And so we'll always, as profitable businesses, want to minimize our need for highly specialized, highly expensive resources. Working together is a great way to reduce our need for this. And I want to talk about two forms of collaboration. One is um, knowledge sharing, person to person, share experiences. Um, I'm an author, as you, was mentioned in my intro, of uh, co-author of the Building Security and Maturity Model. The goal of this was to measure different organizations' maturity in their software security initiatives. And that, that, that's pretty cool, and we have a big report we publish every year uh, as a result of it. But the bigger value we got out of the project is the community that formed around these firms that have been measured. And early on, the firm started asking for uh, a private moderated mailing list so that they could have private communications with one another within the community. They asked for community conferences so that they could come together under Chatham House rules and share details about their security initiatives, what worked, what didn't, best practices, and so on. And although the, the geek in me finds the data crunching and the maturity measurements really interesting, this community of like-minded folks supporting one another, I think, has been a, a much bigger impact on the industry. And so. If there are opportunities for you or your organization to either consume community content or to share content with the community, I really encourage you to do so, because I think we can all do much better if we work together on some of these problems. Early on, I don't think many people would argue today, but early on there was an argument that um, security was an important differentiator, right? I'm going to be a little more secure than the other guys, and therefore people are going to come to me. I think increasingly we've seen that that's a red herring. I think for most verticals, Overall insecurity, the perception of insecurity, and the reduction in customer confidence because of that is more damaging to every firm in the vertical than it is to one that does a little bit better than the others. So I think, again, it's in our best interest to collaborate around these things and to do better as a whole. The other kind of collaboration I want to talk about is um, not human to human. It's computer to computer. And it's sharing threat intelligence, information about the ways we're being attacked, and preferably security intelligence more broadly. There are plenty of seats if anybody wants to sit down. I won't be offended whatsoever. The front row is totally friendly. Um, sharing not only information about how we're being attacked, but also how we're remediating that. And there are several companies, both startups and large organizations, developing platforms to automate this kind of machine-to-machine -machine sharing. I don't think any of them are really at a point of maturity yet. Uh, so I think it's more of an exploration for companies, but I think it's a fantastic idea. We see the same attackers use the same relatively commoditized attacks to attack firm after firm after firm, typically very successfully. And the more we can share about those attacks, the more we can get that information shared in an automated way in front of the people who haven't been attacked yet, the s better the chance they have of defending themselves. There are three attributes of such a, a platform that I think are critical and that I think everyone should look for if they were going to embark in some sort of information sharing effort like this. Um, the first I've already mentioned, I think it has to be automated. Um, early efforts around this were uh, designed to let expert analysts and individuals share intelligence with one another. But the reality is we don't need more stuff to read, right? We don't need more inputs to the analyst. We need um, things taken off of the analyst's shoulders. And so we need to automate as much of the response to this intelligence as possible so that we're not just generating new PDFs for analysts to, to slog through. The next is closely related. The intelligence that we consume from such a platform or a community has to be relevant to us. Right? If we're drinking from the fire hose and 90% of it is about vulnerabilities in uh, Microsoft applications and we're run running a total Linux stack, it's just not helpful to us. Right? So the, 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 the ability to consume relevant information precisely is an incredibly important attribute. And then finally, I think the platforms have to be open. 
Um, these can't lock us into particular vendors because that only increases the need for security professionals in our company that are familiar with that particular vendor's platform, that particular vendor's products. And what we want is to make these roles more generic and more easily fillable by uh, more people because we need to expand the people in the field. Okay, the last one I'll talk about is technology. And I've spent 15 years building security tools, so of course I'm gonna talk about a chainsaw instead. Chainsaw is my favorite tool, and I like it because of certain properties that it has. The first is no one buys a chainsaw, brings it home, drops it off in the backyard, heads inside to eat dinner and goes to bed, and expects to wake up the next morning with all the trees cut down. Right? People understand that chainsaws are tools that enable people to do something much more effectively, but they don't do the thing by themselves. And if we applied the same understanding to software tools more often, I think we would use them much more effectively. Tools don't replace humans in most cases. They make them more efficient, or they offload certain aspects of what that human was wasting their time on. The other thing I like about the chainsaw is um, people treat them with respect, right? Uh, just because I go and buy a chainsaw doesn't mean I'm a lumberjack. I can't go you know, fell a forest full of trees. But likewise, if a lumberjack shows up to work with an ax today instead of a chainsaw, they're going to be laughed off the job, right? They're not well equipped to do that. It's an important piece of their work, but it doesn't do the job for them. Security tools are dangerous when it comes to staffing problems and resource problems because they can actually generate more work than they reduce. Static analysis that I've spent most of my life working on is a great example of this. If you deploy static analysis in the wrong way, or you expect it to solve your problems for you, you're just gonna create a huge volume of work that you're not well equipped to handle. You're gonna generate a bunch of bugs for the development team that aren't ever gonna get addressed, or you're gonna worse create a, a bunch of vulnerability details in a database somewhere that, somewhere that no one's even going to review. So they won't even know that they were a, a bug in the software because no one ever looked at them in the first place. Technology used judiciously, however, can be a great boon. And so my advice around using technology is to use it in precise ways and to use it to address problems, not to check boxes, right? If your problem is you're being attacked in a certain way or you know your developers are making certain kinds of mistakes, use static analysis in a targeted way to address those. Don't just toss it over the wall and expect everyone to start dealing with everything that it produces. That's only gonna create more work and frustrate everybody involved. Um, probably my biggest regret in all the years I spent working on Fortify was the amount of great stuff that we found that no one was able, ever able to act on, right? We found wonderful vulnerabilities that never saw a, a human eye because they lived in a database somewhere and didn't get prioritized in the right way. So thinking about the way you use technology in a smart way to really reduce your need for people and solve the actual problems you have is really, really important. So starting to wrap up a little bit, what are some common misconceptions uh, around the staffing problem, the talent gap? Um, technology, I think, is at the root of a lot of them, right? Either technology is going to solve every problem or it's not going to solve any problems. Um, both of those are, are patently false, right? Use technology intelligently, and it can absolutely help solve the right kinds of problems. To do security, you have to be a professional, or you have to have a certification of some sort, or you need a degree in security. Um, all of this is clearly false, right? Look at, um, around the room, how many people here have degrees in security? Okay, like 3% maybe? Um, how about certifications? Probably a little higher? Okay, 20% maybe? I'll eyeball it, 30%? Um, Probably most of the people here do security for a living, so you're already security professionals. I won't ask about that. But we want to encourage people without the credentials, without the degree, to get interested into the field, interested in the field, and to come into the field. And so perpetuating misconceptions like you need some sort of magic anointment in order to do the job just damages our chances there. In, in that they want, they want that checkbox, they want the degree, they want... Yeah, so I think you know, educating within our companies, educating executives, HR, um, even development around the real nature of the problem is the first step there, right? It's not about, um, it's not about having the security team be fully staffed, it's about um, instilling these properties in our software when it's finished. And lots of people can do the latter, even if 
uh, they don't necessarily belong on the security team. Uh, but it's a real struggle, absolutely. Um, and the last one. You know, I was warned that they want to use microphones for questions. Brooke, do you mind? I've got one more slide, and will you ask that again after okay. that slide? No problem. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and sorry, the last one, and I've seen this just in preparing for this talk the last couple months, all over the press. Oh, there isn't a talent shortage. It's just temporary. It's just exaggerated. It's not a problem. I don't see that, frankly. I'm on the ground, and companies can't find the right people. Com people companies can't fill the positions they need to fill. So I, I just don't believe that's true, and I think there's enough real data out there, some of which I included in the talk today, to, to disprove that. But um, if, if you hear some of these misconceptions, frankly, they're damaging to our efforts to solve this problem, and we all owe it to the, the IT industry to help dispel them whenever possible. All right, so to conclude, um, these were all over the board, right? Some of them are going to take decades to execute, right? What a computer science degree means isn't going to change overnight. But if those of us with access to the knowledge and resources and, frankly, motivation to solve the problem don't start to engage, it's never going to move. Um, just because we can't solve the entire problem today or just because something doesn't have an immediate reward for me or my company doesn't mean it's not worth investing in. With that said, I think there were examples throughout this list of very tactical stuff that someone at almost any level in an organization can begin to execute and see commensurate returns, right? Again, you're not going to solve the whole problem for your company in one day, but you might start to chip away at it one person at a time. I'm going to leave it there, and I know we have at least one question from the audience. <laughs> um, they're recording this, and so they want you to use microphones. So raise your hand and get a microphone and then ask it into that. So, Jake, um, I, this is based on what you said about uh, HR and whatnot. I, I do find that some security teams have a real problem in letting go of the security functions because they're worried it won't be done well, they won't be done perfectly, they have a due diligence responsibility, and so or on. Or they had to fight a massive fight just to exist in the first yeah, place, Yeah, right? or, or, but you get a real foxhole. I, I'm, on some of the security teams I've worked with, there's been a real foxhole kind of mentality that says, you know, those stupid people, developers out there, and us smart people, us security people, we know. And, you know, I don't, I, I don't know. It's not really a question. No, I, Take I, it. I, no, it's, it's absolutely valid, and I see it all the time. I think it's incredibly toxic. And so I think if, if that's the environment, right, it's, it's us versus them, it's security versus development, you have to work to correct that culture or else you're never going to make any progress. Hi, Jake. Um, Sorry, here. wave your... Yeah, there we go. <laughs> I was like... Um, Okay, so I own an IT security recruitment company, um, and the, the the secret, a lot of the stuff you, you talked about is spot on. Um, the, the, there's a couple of secrets that I'm hoping won't put my business, you know, I don't want to put my business out of shape, but um, basically there's a, there's a couple of things that, that's not happening. People aren't talking within the business. Um, we often fill jobs that have been open six months because what the CISO or the recruitment manager is looking for isn't what any of their current agencies are looking for or isn't what the HR people or their internal recruitment people are looking for. They're not communicating. And unless you end up speaking to the right person, that role just sits there and gets unfilled. It's absolutely it's right. right. And, and you know, I promise he didn't pay me beforehand. But <laughs> using specialized recruiting services that actually understand the security field is incredibly important in finding outside candidates because your average HR department, your average recruiter is going to have a really hard time with it. Um, and then if, if they were there to be hired, of course, the problem is they probably don't exist. Yeah, it's not easy. Yeah, it's not an easy job anyway to find. And, there, and, and what you mentioned about um, unrealistic requirements as well. You know, a lot of people need to be realistic about what they're looking for. And, and if companies build um, a way of training or bringing through internships, like you discussed, that's the way to do it. There's Cyberwatch West. I'm on the advisory board for those guys their state colleges and their National Science Foundation uh, funded. They're trying to bring through people. So look at, look at these, these companies that you can uh, pal up with and, and get the first shot at some of those uh, students that are coming through. That's really going to help you. And that's going to help me provide experienced people. There's not enough experienced people out there. 
I saw this hand very early on. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, I love your idea about sharing intelligence, but I have some like uh, you know problems and questions about that. Sure. So the first one, uh, each time when we learning about new you know vulnerability or uh, real breach, uh, the information is very obscure, mostly coming from uh, absolutely you know misleading, I would say, media reports, and there is nothing uh, a security professional can take from this, right? Uh, on the other hand, if you are saying that this should be like an open system with all details, for example, for me personally, it would be enough to see a request and response to understand what the vulnerability is. Mm -hmm. If you're sharing this kind of information with everyone, then even script kiddies will be able to immediately attack everyone, right? So how would you approach who really should have this kind of details? So I think this, this, this question of trust in both directions, correct. right? Who can I trust to share things with and who can I trust as a source of and things how you determine me, how you determine whom to share with? I think is the single biggest challenge in the, the whole concept of sharing intelligence, particularly if we start to try to automate it. Um, I think the answer is to build on existing circles of trust, or at least the, the start of the answer. So we already have communities that are working together and sharing very sensitive information. I think of the ISACs, for example, uh, and they're building automation technology as well. I think you build on those existing circles of trust and relationships between organizations that have some trust between one another, and then you work to automate those existing channels. And as you automate them, hopefully you find ways to expand those circles of trust as well. Um, things like reputation systems could, could play a big role here once you get critical mass of adoption. But I think it's an incredibly hard problem, absolutely. I used to give a whole talk just on that topic, so I, we, we could talk for hours. <laughs> Microphone, hold on, sorry. Uh, hold that for one second. All right. So, um, my name is Brian Zadig. I'm from, I'm from the advisory board company. So um, we actually we have some interesting challenges in terms of finding talent right now in the DC area, um, because a lot of government requirements don't, as you mentioned, um, like they're not specific enough around appsec at like appsec at all in any field like development of products uh, or be it even like security analysts or anything of the sort. So one of the tacks that we're taking, or at least I like I will be taking, Mike McBride back when he was with us is taking. Um, would specifically be to train up developers to get into AppSec from a very Absolutely. early stage. Um, building on that, are there specific points that you see as being just very valuable incentives to bring people to consider it as an appendage to development from a very early stage, like literally entry-level developers? In terms of incentivizing them yes. or getting them excited about it? I mean, so I think there's a large percentage of people who will be great security professionals who just are immediately excited about it, right? The idea of breaking things is exciting. So how do you reach the, the next level out past those? I don't know what motivates people, but apparently money seems to work pretty well. And so I would talk about, I would talk about what huge opportunities there are in this field, right? I mean, if you took a summary of this talk where I said, there aren't enough of these people, half the roles are empty, we can't find enough of them, and you take that to a bunch of new computer scientists who are thinking about what to specialize in, boy, that sounds like a pretty good thing to go specialize in. Can we have one more question because I cut him off before and then we'll stop, I promise. The law of the system, uh, Texas system, yeah. uh, they all have a great depth. Uh, you know, when it comes to acquiring new talent and stuff like that, I've only been in this industry for about two years and I have a hard time breaking in. Welcome, bring people, more. <laughs> right? Okay, but I'm coming up to a barrier. I will break through eventually, but it's yeah. a little aggravating. Yeah. Now, uh, there's a loophole kind of with, with law. In, in, at least in California, you don't actually have to take the bar exam. You can do an apprenticeship. Has there been an idea or is it uh, not feasible uh, to have an apprenticeship? Or the idea of an apprenticeship within our industry? So absolutely within a given company, yes. And every company I've ever worked for does okay, this because it's way, easier, it's way easier to find your AppSec person on your development team than it is outside your company. But so if you're not a sure. developer, then you're kind of screwed, right? It's much harder to teach someone who knows security computer science than it is the other way around. And right. today, such a big part of security is understanding applications. It's not impossible, but it's, it's a, a long road to hoe. Okay. Okay, I'll give up now. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you guys being here.